Father God. Father God, we lift your name up, Father, as being our Father. Our God, we proclaim as a group here tonight, Lord, that you are God. There's no one else worthy of our praise, Father. We exalt you, Lord, as being King of kings and Lord of lords and the one who defines our reality, Lord, and we just praise your holy name tonight, Lord. Thank you for what happened last week, Lord, the fact that we have your ear, Lord, the fact that we can come before your throne, God, confidently knowing uh, that you have an interest in us, Father, because we're covered by the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, God. We thank you for that sacrifice, Lord. It's what brings us here tonight, Lord, to worship a God who is worthy of our praise, who has pulled us out of that depth, Lord, who has saved us, saved us from who we, who we once were, God, and you call us a new creation for your glory, God. I just thank you, God. I thank you for your spirit that's going to be here tonight, that is here tonight, Lord. I thank you for your word, God. I just pray that your spirit helps us to relate to your word well. Helps us to understand what you're trying to reveal to us through your word, Father. You're such a good God, and you've come down, you've touched man, you've given us you in the flesh, and you in the word, Father, and you in each other. And God, we just thank you for what your spirit's about tonight, God. And I just want to take a second just to, to ask a blessing on my friend up here on the stage, Holly Brown, Lord, and, and just her whole family, God, just the sacrifice it takes every week in and out to lead us in worship, Lord, and to be committed to, to singing Praises to your name, Father. And so I ask a blessing on Nate Brown, Lord, as he leads their household, God, and all four of their kids, Lord, just a blessing, a new revelation of you in their life and their family, Lord. We just ask that blessing on Holly and on Nate and their family in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord. Amen. Amen. Y'all can have a seat. Oh, God is good. You know, there's a, there's a preacher man that I follow every now and then on, uh, on the web. And he tells this story, he gives this illustration, it's a real story that happened to him, but uh, he lives down in Dallas, Texas, he has an older home, and that, that home consists of a lot of plaster work. And if any of y'all know about plaster, you know that it cracks. Uh, and so what happened one day is he saw a crack begin to develop in his living room wall, and uh, he dealt with it for just a little bit, but then it just began to grow and grow and grow more. And he's like, man, I gotta, I gotta get somebody in here to take care of this crack. So he called a friend of his, a contractor friend of his, who came, and, uh, came over to assess the situation. He's like, yeah, sure, I can fix that. So his contractor friend decides to go ahead and remove a certain piece of plaster that had a crack in it, replaster with brand new plaster, let it cure, let it dry, and then he came in and repainted it. It looked, looked brand new, looked perfect, looked great. About 30 days later, though, preacher man gets back up and he goes in there and looks out the wall in his living room and he notices, man, that, that crack is back. And it, it just keeps getting bigger. And so he's like, man, I paid this guy good money. He should be able to know what he's doing to come in here and fix my crack. So he calls his contractor back up and says, man, buddy, you know, I paid you for, the, for a fix here, and the, and the fix didn't, didn't, didn't stick. And so if you don't mind coming back over looking at it, he's like, yeah, sure, I'll be right over. So he comes over. He just takes out a kind of a larger piece of plaster and, and covers it with new plaster again, and he goes ahead and paints it. Looks brand new. <clears throat> Day 40 rolls around, and preacher man gets up and looks at that wall. He's like, oh, my gosh, that crack is back. And it's not just the crack that was there. It's the crack on all those family members. I mean, aunts, uncles, nieces, and nephew cracks are there in the wall. It's just a big mess, a big cracky mess. And, and so he's like, you know what, I'm, I'm, for, I'm going to forgo my contractor, buddy. I'm just going to call somebody who specializes in plaster, who knows kind of what they're doing. And so he calls this, this, uh, this, this plaster man over to his house, and the man comes in and takes a look at the cracks and says, uh, yeah, yeah, your problem's, you don't, you don't have a crack problem. The preacher man look, kind of looks at him. He's like, well, I'm, I'm looking right at this crack I don't have a problem with. What do you mean I don't have a crack problem? And he continues to say, you know, I, the, the crack is just a symptom of something, something much deeper that's going on here. He's like, you, you, you got a shifting foundation is what you got. And so, I mean, you, you can patch all you want on these walls all day long, but they're going to keep coming back and coming back and coming back unless we address this foundation issue that you have. If you don't stabilize this foundation, you'll forever be patching walls. When it comes to family, our families nowadays are full of cracks. I think a lot of us can attest to that. I can attest that in my own life to a degree. When we look around, we see brokenness in lives. We see brokenness in families that oftentimes look like they're beyond repair. Things just keep cracking. Things just keep getting a little messier. Our families, not only here at City Church that we know, but families in general in Spokane and the rest of our nation are, are in crisis. They really are. And, and, and in the same vein, the same day, we have a culture that's starting to redefine what family actually is. We have an attack on families. When it comes to families today, there are cracks, and we need to begin to identify those cracks. Understand that our, our family is a war zone. 
And just as in Nehemiah 14, 4, where the Lord God says, fight for your families. Fight for your brother, fight for your sisters, your daughters, your sons, your uncles. Fight for them. We need to fight for our families. We understand that our families are war zone. We need to quit as men and women of God, letting our sociology dictate what our theology is. A lot of times we, we get caught up in what the culture is saying and we forget what the word of God says about families. You know, I'm a, I'm a new father again. Uh, my wife gave birth two weeks ago. And uh, yeah, I applaud her. She did most of the work for sure. But I tell you what, man, life just keeps getting more and more real. It just does, man. Every time a new baby opens up or shows up, I'm like, uh, wow, it, it is really getting real here. Um, and my, my heart, I mean, for the last two weeks, has just had this real rawness, this real sensitivity um, to, to family right now. And my prayer is that that rawness just won't go away because that rawness is, is drawing me into a place with God that, that I think I need to be as, as a father. You see, I'm sleeping upstairs in the house right now in our guest room. My wife, I'm, I'm allowing her, letting her sleep down with just the baby so she can kind of get the best sleep she can, you know, not having to take care of the toddlers who sleep upstairs. So I'm just kind of letting her do her thing downstairs with Asif during the middle of the night. And I've just committed to, uh, to be upstairs with our three-year-old who's being potty trained and our, you know, little two-year-old that the three-year-old keeps trying to steal the passy in the middle of the night and, and take it from her. So she ends up crying and waking up. I'm just trying to keep my wife from having to come up the stairs every hour on the hour. So I've committed to be that guy who sleeps in the guest room and who just listens for our kids next door. And what I'm finding is, you know, I'm, I'm waking up at weird hours of the night. I mean, just the other night I woke up about, I don't know, 3 a.m. And my, my son was, uh, was kind of talking in his sleep and then kind of crying out. So I kind of just went over there and, and asked him, I said, hey, what's up? Do you, do you need to go potty? Oh, yeah, I need to go potty. So went in the bathroom. He sat on the pot for what seemed like forever. And he finally did his, did his thing. I zipped him up, put him back to bed, kissed him. And I went back to my room. Problem was, I just couldn't get back to sleep. I was wide awake. I mean, I sat there in the bathroom for half an hour, just waiting for my son to do his thing. And and uh, and so I'm here in bed and I and and, and restless. And I just, you know, I, I've just when I can't sleep at night, I, I've learned to do one thing, and that's just begin to pray to the Father and just allow Him to start defining where I'm at and why I can't sleep and the angst that's inside of me or whatever it might be going on. And what I've noticed is um, because of this rawness in my heart about being a new dad. Um, my prayer life and my sensitivity and my thought is really geared towards my family right now. Um, and so I found myself on what had been Thursday night praying for three specific things. I found myself at three in the morning praying for uh, protection for my family, uh, protection of the innocence that's currently in my kids. You know, I think of my two-year-old daughter and just how, how innocent, how pure she is. And so I'm just praying, Lord, just protect her. Protect my boys from the things that I had to see, the things that, that infiltrated my existence, Lord. I protect my boys from that. I protect my home from things that, that just aren't of you, you know, whether it comes to the TV, whether it comes to my own personal testimony and, and language, or whether it comes from the friends I keep. God, just protect my kids' innocence. And protect them, Lord, from deception. I, there's just so many dissenting voices, so many untruths that are being spoken throughout the world right now. God, just protect their minds. I want your word to be truth. I want um, your truth to be manifested in my life so they can understand what truth is. And so God, protect their minds. So I'm praying for protection for my kids and, and I'm praying for, for provision. And it's not, it's not provision for finances. I mean, God has showed himself time and time and time and time and time and time again that he's faithful when it comes to my physical needs as far as feeding my family and covering my family. So that's not the type of prayer I was praying. I was praying more for, um, for provision for ministry. I was praying for health. I was praying, you know, we got heart disease in my family. We got diabetes in my family. I was just praying for health. I want to be available to my family so I can minister to my family, so I can be the guy I need to be. Uh, it's not just my family, but to you guys and to other people I know. God, grant, grant me with some health so I, can, so I can have long days and so I can be engaged in a real effective way. God, I need more time in my day, not in the sense that he gives me more hours, but in the sense that he helps me streamline my days and decide what's important and prioritize a little better. You know, maybe sloth off the things that don't necessarily need, need to be there and prioritize just a bit so I can be more effective. So I, so, I, so I have time to notice the brokenness around me and then engage it, not just walk by it and say, man, he's broken, you know? We were talking at men's group, actually at prayer, prayer night on, on Thursday night, about discipling and why, why we sometimes don't disciple. And, I, and where the Spirit took me is, man, we're just too busy. We're just too busy, man. Our schedules are so full, we don't even have time if we wanted to to take time off to, to minister to somebody else. So that's when my mind went on Thursday, was, was praying for, for more time. I was praying for wisdom. Lord, provide me with more wisdom so when my little babies come up and they ask me questions, I can speak to them 
um, directly and truthfully about these things they bring up. God, give me the courage I need to speak boldly as you give me this wisdom. It's one thing to have wisdom. It's another thing to be able to speak tactfully and in love towards somebody else in wisdom with that wisdom. So God, provide these things. Protect my family. Provide these things. And then finally, I was praying for revelation. Because you see, God has, has raised me up. He's built me into a man that is a living testimony, a living document talking about God's truth to the world. And, we, and, and I have the word of God. I have the Bible that, that he's given us um, written down and, and preserved that I can give to my family, that I can give to my kids. But unless the spirit of God is there in the mix, revealing these things to my babies and, and helping them translate my life into their life, um, it's off or not. I need the spirit of God in a huge way to be a part of my family. I, I need him so badly. So, Spirit of God, please reveal yourself in my life and in my wife's life and in our relationship together. Reveal yourself to my kids. Because, guys, I believe, once again, this rawness in my heart is leading me to this decision, leading me to this stance. But I believe that I've been raised up for such a time as this to advance God's kingdom uh, through not only my own testimony of who John Leland is, but through my family's testimony. I just believe that's how God is advancing his kingdom or wishes to advance his kingdom within my context as far as I'm concerned with the advancement of my, of my family, testimony of my family. Anybody who knows me um, knows that I, I speak a lot of kingdom stuff. I'm a big kingdom guy. I don't believe that we just exist by chance. I believe we have an intelligent God who has designed my existence and designed our existence, not only individually but together. Um, I, don't, I don't live under the authority of this world. I don't live under the authority of this culture. I live under the authority of a God. A God who's all-knowing, a God who's all-loving. I live under his sovereign rule, his loving rule, his well-intentioned rule. And my desire, even though I don't live up to it all the time, but my true heart desire, my true heart desire is that I'll be wholeheartedly submitted to God's kingdom agenda at all times. Personally, with my family, with you guys in relationship, with the world out, outside these walls. Dr. Tony Evans, he's a online evangelist. He has his own church down in Dallas, Texas. He defines the kingdom agenda as the visible demonstration of the comprehensive rule of God over all life. A kingdom agenda is that, that visual demonstration, something we can see, touch, hear, feel, that visual demonstration, you, me, that visual demonstration of the comprehensive, all-encompassing rule of God in our lives. That's what the kingdom agenda is. That's what God is, is moving forward with his church is a people who show God with who they are. That visual demonstration of that testimony begins with the individual. And that's why I just, I'm so thankful for the, for the series that Caleb just took us through, that ide- identity series in Christ. Because that's where it begins. It begins with us understanding who we are in God. Understanding what actually happened at the cross of Jesus Christ when that blood was spilled and when it covered our sins and when it made us a new creature, when it replaced our heart of stone with a heart of flesh and it gave us an authority that the world doesn't have, but that we as followers of God do have. It begins with that identity, that individual identity. And then it moves from there and it moves into, naturally, it moves into the family. Because we're parts of family. All of us have been born, I think. We're all parts of families. So it moves from that individual, moves into the family. And then from the family in a godly context, a kingdom context, it moves into the church. And then from the church, if we're in alignment with God, if we're under his authority, his kingdom agenda, from the church is going to burst forth into society. So I don't believe we're going to have a lasting impact in society until three things are in place, and that's our individual walk with God, our understanding of family, our understanding of church, and then from there we can, we can actually have a significant impact in the world around us. It's God's kingdom agenda. And so I believe the second most paramount thing other than ourselves and our personal relationship with God is the family. The kingdom agenda is banking on families. When the family unravels, the kingdom is in trouble. You know, we can't give in to the breakdown of families just because our society gives into the breakdown of families. We've got all these solutions on how to deal with broken families as a society. And a lot of them just mean raising the white flag and just kind of moving on. We as Christians, we as followers of God, are under a different rule. We're under a different kingdom. We're under God's kingdom. And so I think, I think the key to defining family, the key to the definition of family is to understand that the family was created for kingdom. Once again, I'm a kingdom guy, so I'm going to keep saying that word a lot tonight. All right, the key of the, the, to the definition of the family is to understand that the family was created for kingdom. 
not our happiness. That's a byproduct. Don't get me wrong. That's a, that's a total benefit of family. I love my babies. I love my wife. I love my family. They make me happy. They make me smile. They give me joy. But that is not the purpose for my family. The purpose for my family is not my happiness. The purpose for my family is kingdom. So I want to show you that tonight by going to Genesis chapter 1. So if you got your Bibles, we're not going to have it on the screen tonight. So if you got your Bibles or your pads or your smartphones or your friend's Bible beside you, feel free to look at Genesis chapter 1 with me. Start in verse 6, uh, 26 actually. Verse 26. Genesis 1, verse 26. Y'all there? You there? Good deal. All right. Genesis 126. Then God said, Let us make man in our image. This is the triune God, the Trinity, the God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Spirit. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, things of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So God created family for what purpose? Well, looking at Genesis 1, I see a purpose of ruling. A lot of times we get kind of caught up on that word rule because we've seen it used so poorly in the context of our lives where somebody lords over somebody or somebody rules who's not underneath the rule of God. And so that, that, that word rule has a weird connotation to us sometimes. So let's think of it more as dominion, all right? That's what ruling is in the, in the context of Genesis. God created the family for the purpose of having dominion over something. What's key about this verse, too, is you see God saying, let us create man in our image, all right? He just didn't go out and create something unique. He created man in the image of God. Because as we have dominion as families and as people, we're supposed to be image bearers of God as well. We're supposed to take the likeness of God in the context of our family to the world that needs to see God so desperately. The family mirror, mirrors the triune God. And then we're called to replicate that, that image in history. So you got the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit creating man and woman, calling them family, in the expectation of us projecting that image to the people around us. We see the command of being fruitful and multiply. And this doesn't mean just having babies, just having lookalikes. You know, I, I'm, I'll be the first to commit, uh, admit my, my babies are cute, you know. But, uh, but it's, I, the reason I have babies is, is, is not to just have lookalikes, not just have cute little babies. The reason I have babies is because I'm answering the call of God to be fruitful and multiply. And by the time my babies leave my home, I want them to bear the image of God on their lives so that they can go out and show the world what God looks like. And not only that, but so they can find their own families, and start their own families, and continue to multiply that family in the context of this broken world. That's the purpose of families, is to promote the image of God, to grow it exponentially. What we've done is we've taken the benefit of the family, we've taken the benefit of the family, the happiness, the, uh, the companionship, the sexuality, we've taken the benefit of, of family, and we made it the reason for family. It's what we've done as a nation. It's what we've done as individuals from time to time. We, but we need to get back to God's design, God's designation of family. It's to mirror God, to mirror this, this unified diversity, which is God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, to mirror this and reflect it in history. So how does one mirror a triune God? How does a family mirror a triune God? Well, Triune God has distinct roles. They're equal in essence. I mean, God is God is God is God, you know? You got God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. They're all God, but they all have distinct and individual and separate roles. And by fulfilling these distinct roles, that Godhead, that triune God, that Trinity that we worship and call God, it's able to function as it's supposed to, as they're supposed to, as they, as they desire to. You see Jesus in John chapter 6, verse 38 saying, I didn't come to do my own will. I came to do the will of the Father. So you got the Father, and then you got John, Jesus in John chapter 6 saying, I didn't come to be God the Father. I came to do the will of the Father. So you got God, Jesus, saying, I came to do the will of the Father. And then Jesus speaks about his Holy Spirit, about the Spirit, God. 
in John chapter 16, 14, and he says, the Spirit has come to glorify the Son. And so you see this alignment that happens in Scripture. You see this alignment that happens in the creation narrative that you have God the Father, God the Son, who glorifies the Father, and God the Spirit, Spirit who glorifies the Son. That's their design. That's who they are. They're equal, but they function differently. They got distinct roles. God has given all of us and families distinct roles as well. Once again, not for our benefit, even though it is a benefit, but for his glory and for his name's sake. A lot of times in families nowadays, there's a little bit of unbroke or there's a little bit of brokenness and a little bit of unfulfillment. And, uh, and we, just, we just chalk it up and we say, oh, it's just, I mean, I, I just got to find another spouse. I just got to find another person to, uh, to do life with because this one's just not working out. You know, there's a story of a guy, and it's kind of a cheesy story, but I'm going to tell it anyway. There's a story of a guy who uh, is on an airplane, and he's got his wedding ring on his, on his right hand. And he's sitting there, and he got a guy sitting beside him. He's like, man, are you married? And he's like, well, yeah. He's like, well, you got your wedding ring on your right hand. He's like, well, I married the wrong woman. You know, and that was kind of his response. And I'm like, man, man that's, so, that's totally bogus, man. That's totally bogus. He didn't marry the, the right woman or the wrong woman. It's just the fact that you and that woman weren't aligned with God and his calling in your life. That's why it's not working out. That's why there's brokenness. That's why there's unfulfillment. There's something out of, out of kilter there as far as your alignment goes with God. You know, from a wife and I, and I just want to preface this, this comment by, I, you know, I'm, this sermon is not to, to knock anybody who's out here. I love you guys deeply, man, or else I wouldn't be up here. All right? It's not, to, it's not to, to fill you with doubt. It's not to, to embarrass you or shame you in one way, shape, or form. I'm just telling you the testimony of God in my life and how he has revealed scripture to me in my life and some of the truths, all right? So my wife and I, as we consider our roles, as we consider our relationship to God the, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit, um, we've just we've come to the commitment, and we made the commitment 15 years ago that no, no is just not an option. It's just not an option, you know? We've had we've had some bumpy spots, man. We've had some times where I've been such a punk, bunch of punk, but we've navigated it. I've sought forgiveness. I, I was broken before God because of my sin nature and because of the sin in my life manifested towards my wife, and and we repented and we forgave and we we moved on. We sought God and we wanted to be aligned under under Him. You know, we made the commitment that through thick or thin, man, till death do us part. No is just not an option for us. And I think as, as men and women of God, in the context of marriage, seeing how God is the one who put us together, no simply just isn't an option for us. You know, Satan aims to disrupt the family. He aims to disrupt this family's alignment under God so as to remove our dominion, so as to remove our, our image of God from the world. See, if he can break the family, if he can disrupt who we are as he designed us to be, then, then he, can, he can take the minds of man because there's no longer the image before man of God. Let's go to Genesis chapter 2. So you, Genesis is kind of broken into a couple of different creation narratives. You have one where, in Genesis chapter 1, where it's showing the, the full scope of creation for the most part. And then you have Genesis chapter 2 where it really begins to get relational and talks specifically about the creation of man. So it's the same creative narrative, just kind of broken out with two distinct uh, purposes, I guess. So in Genesis chapter 2, we'll start in verse 15. We see that God has already created Adam. And we see that the Lord God puts man in the garden. So it says in verse uh, 15, it says, And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely. But from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. And so we see Adam here on his own by himself, and God speaking this to Adam. What I thought was interesting while I read through this is God gave Adam his call, his instruction, prior to bringing Eve into the mix, prior to bringing the woman, the wife, into the mix. And I had to ask myself that question, why? Why, is, why did he decide to, to do it that way? I think what he's showing Adam is that who Adam is is not defined by his sexuality. Who Adam is is defined by the call that's on his life. Adam's call trumps his sexuality. He's trying to show Adam that, that it's not just about certain things 
about a guy. It's about the call in his life. So my challenge to men, you know, before, before there's ever a woman in your life, you need to recognize and submit to the call that's on your life, and that's to be in alignment with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. Be in alignment with that triune God. In chapter 1, we see the creative narrative. And the word for God in chapter 1 is Elohim. It's a Hebrew word, Elohim. And this is a word that describes God as being a powerful God, a God that can create. So you got a God who can just speak the universe into existence and speak the water and the dry land into existence. You can speak animals into existence and call them good. That's the kind of God that is being described by, by the word Elohim. In chapter 1, it's a God who's just flexing his muscles and saying, I am a powerful God. But what we see in chapter 2, we see a different reference to God. And we see a word placed before the word God, which is the word in our Bible is Lord. L-O-R-D, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. This word in Hebrew is Jehovah. And what Jehovah means, it, it takes on a whole relational context to God. And so not only do you have a powerful God, but you have a God that relates to his creation. God, it, 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 Jehovah means, you know, God's relational control or his management over his creation. That's, that's what that word means. So, so I'm no longer just a God of power. I'm a God of instruction. It's kind of what he's getting at there, kind of what the text is getting at there in chapter 2. So God instructed Adam. He gave him his, his instruction. We just read that. He gave him his instruction on how to live a life in the garden. Before there was a woman, he gave that instruction. The man was supposed to learn how to function under God before he was given a woman. Otherwise, that woman's just going to be messed up. You know, when we look out to the world and there's a lot of messed up women, it's not, it's not the women's fault. I think it's the men's fault. I think we've got a lot of messed up men in this world that haven't learned how to align themselves under God's call. I've noticed, and I'm so glad I noticed, but I'm starting to believe and think that, uh, that women are created in a certain way. Well, I know they are. I mean, obviously, God's designed. He created women in a certain way. But, but I think women are innately created by God to receive and to respond. Because what I've noticed in my marriage over the last 15 years and us dating four years before that is that when I would treat my wife with contempt and with malice and with anger, she would respond in contempt and malice and anger. But when I would respect, re, 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 give my wife love and affirmation and respect, um, she would give me love and affirmation and respect. It's kind of interesting how that works, isn't it? I believe it's a, it's a, it's a written rule from God that, that women are created to receive and then to respond. And if you even look at the church, I mean, I didn't have this in my notes, but I wanted to share with you. But even if you look at the church, you know, you see church as Christ being the head, Christ kind of being... Uh, held up as, as the, the, the male in, in the equation. And then you see the church as the bride of Christ. I mean, look at what just happened in our worship service. We received something from God. We received the blood of Christ, his saving grace, and we respond. It's the same thing with our wives. They receive and they respond. And so if you look out and you're kind of frustrated with a woman in your life, I would say look first in the mirror and just kind of see how you're aligned with God. You see too many men refusing to recognize the Jehovah God, the Lord God. We did a Bible study with the men on Friday nights, uh, I don't know, five months ago, something like that. And it's really easy to understand God as our Savior. I mean, we, we, we get that right away because that saves us from hell. That, that gets us out of there. You know, we have, we're a new creation. We, 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 we are a new person because of that saving grace of God, the Father. But oftentimes it's hard for us, I think especially as men, to wrap our mind about what it, around what it means to, to have a Lord God, to wrap our minds around the Lordship of God. So I sat in that group of men, and I asked the question, okay, we talked the last few weeks about God the Savior. What does it mean to have God the Lord, the Lord God? I'll tell you what, it was a tense, intense conversation we had. It wasn't an easy one to have. So now we got women come on the scene. It's where it gets fun. Genesis chapter 2, verse 22. Genesis chapter 2, verse 22. I love this, man. The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from man. The Lord God fashioned a woman 
from the rib that he had taken from man. You know, when God made man, he just picked up some clay, some dirt, and there's a guy. Man, when the woman came on the scene, God took a rib and he fashioned. How many men out there agree that women have been fashioned by God? Oh, man, I agree. Fashioned by God. That word fashioned has an awesome meaning. That word fashioned means that she was built with intentionality. As he was fashioned, she wasn't just thrown together. She wasn't just some recipe off Pinterest. She was fashioned for a purpose with intentionality. Man, what a killer, killer word. Fashioned by God. And then after God fashioned woman from the rib and was known to God and God known to her, he then brought her to man. He didn't, she, didn't, she didn't wake up beside man one morning. She was made fashioned and then God brought her to man. To God was the ultimate matchmaker. He made the first marriage happen. He did. He brought woman to man. He was that matchmaker. And the reason he was that matchmaker because he wants and he desires to be in the middle of every single marriage out there. His desire is to be in the middle of every single marriage that's in existence. He wants to be in the middle of everything. He never wants the family to exist without him in the middle of it. Middle of it. I believe that the strength and the decay of a nation has a direct correlation to the strength and the decay of families. I just believe that. I see it. I felt the nastiness at times in my own family. It's where that decay creeps in, and it's a, it's a, it's a horrible feeling. But I believe the strength and the decay of a nation has a direct correlation to the strength and decay of families. And Satan believes this too. He knows this. He knows that whoever owns the family owns the future. You see, family, once again, is a foundational piece of God's kingdom agenda. He is using families to promote himself to this world, to show the world himself. So why, if you have an agenda contrary to God's kingdom agenda, why wouldn't you just attack the family? And that's exactly what we see playing out. That's exactly what we see happen here in Genesis chapter 3. So moving forward to Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Indeed, God has said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden. The woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took its fruit and ate. And she gave also to her husband with her and he ate. And the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked. find it interesting that Satan never bothered Adam, as far as this text goes, when he was a single guy. But when Adam got married, all hell broke loose. Satan, Satan came on the scene. You see, Satan wasn't just off to, after the person of Adam. He was after the program. He was after the institution of marriage because he knew what marriage held for the kingdom agenda. To destroy the marriage is to destroy the kingdom of God. At the heart of the definition of the expansion of the kingdom of God, and his agenda in history is the stability of the family. And that's why there's a war that exists in our culture today against family. That war exists. And to, deny it, to, not, to, to deny it is just to be naive. The family's under attack. It's being destroyed because people have not come under the lordship of God. Genesis chapter 3, verses 3 through 5, I find really interesting as well. This whole entire account is just full of amazing things. But when you read through verse 3 through 5, but from the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, or you surely will not die. For God knows that in that day you will eat from it and your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. What do you see missing from that equation? We just saw in, in chapter 2 that God is being referenced now as Lord God. And now we see Satan revert to Elohim, to God, instead of the Lord God. So pretty much what Satan is here is saying, you know, um, you, can, you can keep your religion. Definitely keep your religion. But let's just keep the lordship of God out of it. You know, feel free to just come and you, you just sing these songs until your little heart's content. 
You just listen to every online message you want to. You just read the Bible daily. That's perfect. But just keep the Lordship out of it. Keep the Lord God out of it. He can't call the shots. It's pretty much what Satan is saying here. None of us can deny that there's a creation. None of us can deny that this Elohim created this. It's right here in front of us. Scripture says that all creation cries out, and every man and woman knows that God is God. They know because it's just innate. You can't deny God's existence. But what Satan's denying is, is God's lordship. So he didn't go to Adam either. What I find interesting about this is he goes to Eve. A lot of times Eve gets a lot of flack for this. Women get a lot of flack for this. It's one of those verses that people like to throw in women's faces. But I'll tell you once again, man, look in the mirror. Who did God give the instruction to? Adam. God gave the instruction to Adam before a woman came on the scene. Adam was supposed to transfer this to Eve, which he did. I believe he did because you see Satan re refute it in, in the story that we just read, in the account that we just read. You see him refute these things that Adam did tell her. But what we see, we see God, or we see Satan, excuse me, trying to thwart the design of God. You know, he gave this instruction to Adam. He asked Adam to relate to the woman. And then instead of Satan coming to the man, who is authoritative and, and, and supposed to be answering that role, he decides to go uh, to the woman instead. He kind of throws that whole relationship out of kilter, out of alignment. And that's his goal. His goal is to throw that order out of order so he can bring in hell's order. That's what he wants to do. He wants to uh, men to be out of alignment with God. He wants women to be out of alignment with men who are under the divine authority of God. If Satan can reverse that order, he can disrupt the design and he can control our homes. I want to move to the New Testament before we, before we end. So I'm going to go to 1 Corinthians because I don't want this to just be an ancient story. I want it to be a relevant story that transforms families. 1 Corinthians 11. Verse 3. So here's Paul talking to the church in Corinth. And he says, but I want you to understand, I want you to understand this, that Christ is the head of every man, and the man is the head of every, excuse me, I got to make sure I read that correctly. But I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man, and the man is the head of a woman. And God is the head of Christ. Man is not the head of every woman. He's the head of a woman, your wife, your bride, the one who God gave to you for a sovereign purpose. You're the head of her. And God is the head of Christ. See, every, every man to fulfill his role needs to be under the headship of God. Every woman to fulfill her design role, her design distinctive, beautiful role, is to be under man as man is under God. If man is not under God, women are not called to be under man. Women are called to be in a man who are in alignment and, and submitted to God. And then obviously we read in Ephesians chapter 6 that children are being submitted to their parents. So that's kind of the alignment we see. Can you see that kind of build? You saw a build in the creation story, but you see a build here again in the New Testament. That alignment to God. God, man, woman, children. You see that God design, that God alignment. And Satan's goal is to just disrupt that role however he can, disrupt that rule however he can. God's advance of his kingdom is foundationally found in the family. If that foundation is destroyed, then our culture is destroyed. Our culture is in trouble. The main reason of our nation falling apart is the breakdown of the family. I already said that. And there aren't too many issues that you, that you can see in, in society. I mean, you just think of poverty, you think of crime, that you can't attribute back to the family. You know, there obviously wasn't a role model. There obviously isn't a man who's, who's providing for his, his family and and, and allowing them to eat. There's obviously not somebody who's just taught these people how to, um, to live correctly. So, I mean, a lot of these things that we see in society that we get so ticked off about have a direct correlation, in my opinion, to, to the family and the breakdown of the family. It takes us back to Genesis chapter 18, where the gospel message starts kind of coming into play a little bit. I love how that message just continues to show itself in Scripture. Genesis chapter 18, verse 19. So this is God speaking about Abraham. For I have chosen him, I have chosen him that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice, 
so that the Lord may bring upon Abraham what was spoken to him. God's pretty much saying in this verse, I have chosen you, Abraham. I have chosen you to bring to you all that I have promised, but I'm going to do it through the development of your family. Did you catch that? It wasn't just because Abraham was a great guy and because he was faithful. He was faithful with his family. It's exactly what it says. You see in Scripture, too, you see God, the Father, references the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I've always kind of wondered why, they're, why they always say that, but I think why they say that is because they want to tie it to the family. There's, there's family relevance there. It's a family connection that is so important. The reason Abraham was blessed with the lineage of Christ and bringing salvation into the world was because he was a family man, and he pointed his family's face to the Father. And it's a fight, guys, that we need to fight for our families. I think every man that's within earshot of my voice, you must be under the rule of God. You must be under the rule of God to have any impact in your family. You must be under the rule of God, any, any great impact, any lasting impact, any kingdom impact in your family. We need to be under the rule of God, man. We need to be able to say confidently that as for me and our house, we will serve the Lord, just as Joshua said. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, and I am under divine authority. I am a kingdom man. I'm under divine authority. We as men, men, need to be able to say that. We must be under the rule of God. Women, you need to be under, under, under the rule of your husband so long, once again, as he's under divine authority, so long as he's under the divine authority of God and children, any children in the audience need to be under divine authority as to the Lord under your parents. When everyone gets in alignment, when the family's finally getting in alignment, then at that point, we can be happy. Then at that point, the benefits, the kingdom benefits come into play when the family's in alignment. Because you can, I mean, you can, seek fam- you can seek happiness outside of alignment, but it's just not going to last very long. It's not going to last very long because the benefits of the kingdom are found within the kingdom confines, the confines and the design of the family. I think it's absolutely critical, guys, that if we're going to save our nation, we better save our families. Our families need to be a rock, need to be built on a rock. And as I was writing this down, I, you know, once again, being a father of small kids, I'm just reminded of the, the, the tale of the three little pigs. You know, you got the, the big bad wolf who huffs and puffs, and he blows down the house of straw. He huffs and puffs, blows down the house of sticks. But our house needs to be built on a very, very strong foundation, which is God himself. And Satan can just wear himself out trying to blow and blow and blow. I'm not going to be naive and say that there's not going to be any blowing that's going to come into our context. There's going to be some issues and some problems that are going to come into this family of God. But I tell you what, man, if we have the mindset of Nehemiah 14 and we fight for our families, Satan's going to wear himself out blowing and blowing and blowing. A lot of the single men in the audience might uh, be saying, man, this would have been a great Sunday just to stay home and watch football. But I tell you what, until you get a family, you need to get ready for a family. Before you get a family, you need to be, you be ready for a family. You need to be the right kind of person. So when the right person comes along at the right time, you can have dominion and advance the kingdom of God through your family. Hopefully that's to your desire as single men of God. Be under under God. So when God brings that beautiful woman who he fashioned for his glory, for his purpose, you can align yourself under God with her and change, change this world. I've already referenced just the broken families that kind of exist here at City Church. And once again, I'm not preaching the sermon to, to shame. I'm not preaching the sermon to, to drive a wedge. I'm preaching the sermon to show you um, God's intentional design for showing the world more of him. It's through relationship. It's relationally through his creation. There's a lot of families in here that have suffered from divorce. I mean, I know a lot of families here personally. There's families here that have suffered because of a loss and death. There's family here that have brokenness because of there's, there's unbelieving spouses in the mix. Your man's just not coming here with you. Some of us, me included, we just have family conflict. We just, there's just a family member that we just don't have access to anymore because of life circumstances. There's a brokenness in my family just as there's a brokenness in your family. But what I love about God, the Father, is you know, this, this breakdown of families in our society didn't, did not catch him by surprise. He's not responding 
out of haste and out of, you know, ignorance. Our God is not an ignorant God. Our God responded before time began. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5, we see that. He knew that there was going to be breakdown of families. What Ephesians 1, 5 says, he says that he predestined, predestined us to the adoption as sons and daughters through Jesus Christ himself. Predestined. It wasn't an afterthought. Because he loves us so much, he predestined his son to die on a cross for us according to his kind intention, is what the word says, his kind intention. He's not a malicious God. He's a loving and kind and intentional God. So we're all part of a family. Those of us who would call on the name of Jesus Christ as being Lord, we're all part of a family. So even in the midst of our brokenness, even in the midst of these crazy things that are happening in our, in our immediate families, we're brought together in a unique family called the Church of God. And so I just think it's a perfect time, once again, to, to celebrate communion together. You know, we've done it the last, I don't know, six weeks in a row, which is kind of a record for us. But let's make it seven. Because I just, I think it's a beautiful example of God's intentionality. God sent his son to die on a cross, to spill his blood, so that my sin nature would be covered, so your sin nature would be covered. So we'd be made new creations and brought into a new family. So even though brokenness exists in our families, we can take hope knowing that we're part of a, a, a higher family. So even in the physicality of our broken physical family, we're part of a spiritual body, the body of Christ, that, that welcomes you in, that holds you up as being a dear brother and dear sister, and we can exalt him as father together. So I hope this message is a message of, of, of hope more so than shame or, or, or brokenness. I hope you see that you have a God who is intentional, a God that loves you, a God that wants to trumpet his cause, which is a great cause to the world around us, and he wants to use you as individuals and you as families to do that. So our typical MO here at City Church is we kind of start singing a song and we kind of um, just kind of come up as we feel led and, and have communion together. Uh, but I'm going to get a little chaotic tonight, and I just want us all to kind of stand up together if you're able. If you're not, that's fine. If you're not, just raise your hand. I'll bring it to you. That's fine. But I want us to do this as a family. So I want us to just stand up as we kind of sing the song together and share in communion together, understanding that we are the body of Christ. We're family. So let's celebrate that together tonight for the communion. Go ahead and take and eat if you haven't already, if you have it with you. We're doing this as a family tonight. Father God, I just place in front of you, God, my brothers and sisters here at City Church, Lord, every single one of us right here in this place, Father, I just lay at your feet, God. Not knowing entirely each other's past and where we come from and, and what we're about right now, Lord. Uh, I walk closely with some people in this room. But, Father, my love is the same for each one of these people in this room, Father. And, and my desire, Lord, is for us as a church and us as, a, as individuals and us as families, Lord, to be submitted uh, to your call on our, our lives, Father. God, not just so we can look good, not just so we can have it all figured out and be put together, Father, but because that's your design for us, God. You, you know what's best for us as individuals, and you put us into families, God. You've created man and woman, and you put us together for your sovereign purpose, God, which is your kingdom, and to show your likeness to this world around us that needs to see you so desperately, Father. So, God, give us a greater revelation to you as it relates to us as singles, as us as, as family members, as us that come from broken families, Lord. Give, give us a greater revelation of you, Father. God, I thank you for your intentionality, Lord. Of even, even in the midst of brokenness, God, you, you meet us and you touch us and you heal us, God. Even in the crazy times that my family has, has had of just uh, being in strife and argument, Lord, you, you've brought us back together, God, because you've shown each one of us, both of us, God, uh, who we are without you and our deep need for you and who you blessed us with, God. You've opened our eyes to the things of you, Father, and that's the only reason my family exists, God, is because you're a good God, Lord, and you've designed us to be together, God, and so I acknowledge you as being a good God who, who holds families together, God, for a purpose. And so, God, those of you who need a, a stronger holding tonight, Father, I, I pray that you meet those families right where they're at, God. Uh, those, those husbands or those wives that just have not been able to forgive, God, I pray that you'll 
you'll, you'll pierce their soul tonight, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord. And just loose their hearts, Father, with forgiveness, God. I pray that they can forgive, Lord. For those families, those mothers and fathers that have embittered children, children that just uh, say no all the time to family. And who are rebellious, God, I pray that you will do a work in those children's lives, Father, to, to bring them back, Lord, to soften their hearts, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, Father. God, I pray that you will give those families peace tonight, Father. Knowing that you're an intentional God, a well-thought-out being who, who, who thinks through the needs of the people before we even recognize them as being our needs, Father. And you provided a way. God, we praise you for being that kind of God. God, the men in this room, Lord, I just pray specifically for them right now, Lord, that they can be men who are aligned under your authority, God. There's so many things in this world that want to take us away and, and disalign us, throw us out of alignment with you, Father. But God, I pray that there will be a deep burning in our hearts to just get right with you tonight, God. And God, as we get right with you as men, Father, I pray that you can give us the wisdom to lead our families well, Father. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness, God. I thank you for being here tonight. I thank you for your word, Lord, that speaks so much truth into my life, Lord. I pray that it does a transformation in my life as it does a transformation in my brothers and sisters here tonight, Lord. Just pray these things in the name of Christ, Lord, and the power of the risen Savior, Lord. We pray these things. Amen. Anyone here tonight who, who needs specific prayer or feels a desire to pray uh, with me or with Caleb or Jason, feel free just to pull us aside. I'd love to pray for any brokenness that, that might be in your family. But just go tonight. Be blessed. And, uh, and I'll see you, see you real soon. Love you guys.